For Krumo Media's Polity, I'm Sash Nimodli. Joining me today is hotelier Lindiwe Sangweni Sido, here to unpack her book, The Syndicate of 22 Natives, The Stan Sangweni Story. This book is a tribute to your father, Stan Sangweni, but begins with the story of your great-grandfather in the 1900s, who was a part of the group that called themselves the Syndicate of 22 Natives. Can you tell us a bit about that history and about how the group secured land at a time when black South Africans were being dispossessed of their land? Yes, so um, thanks, Sashni. The title is significant, the Syndicate of 22 Natives. Uh, my great-grandfather was Mkodeni Kumalo, and this was my father's grandfather on his maternal side. And he was a traditional Zulu man and had seven wives and worked as a, a farm laborer. But he was also very entrepreneurial, we're told. So this is already now in the early 1900s. He's probably at that time in his 30s and working in a place called Mange, which is sort of like in the mountain side of northern Newcastle. And he's working for this farmer, um, but also hustling on the side. And his side hustle was to transport and provide logistics for the Africana farmers who needed to move livestock and um, produce, etc., from one town to the other. And I think all of this being done because he recognized that he had to put some money aside. He had to make savings. He had seven wives. His families were growing. And uh, he needed to look after everyone. So during this time, he was approached by another Kumalo man. And this is also an interesting part, which I'm sure the reader will enjoy once they read the book, is the Kumalo, whom I describe as Kumalo without an H, approaches him. They're not necessarily, they were not relatives. They were not blood relatives. But in the, our Zulu tradition and most African traditions, once your surnames are the same, you look for the lineage and, you know, just the fact that you come from the same clan is enough. So they took a liking to each other, Mgodeni Kumalo and a man called R.H. Kumalo. R.H. was for Robert Hughes. Very educated. He was from the elite. He was an exempted native. Native law was already in play which meant the colonization of South Africa had long started and coming through from the Cape Colony and up. And it really meant that there were all sorts of laws against customary Zulu or traditional customs. So if you didn't practice polygamy, if you didn't drink traditional brew, if you stuck with the missionary ways, you were an exempted black. So it's this exempted Kumalo meeting a non sort of conformed Kumalo. And they talk about a land opportunity. He introduces him and other men who are in this area to a land opportunity to acquire a place called Suspense Farm. And the formation of the group was in all the title deed documentations referred to as the 22 natives, the syndicate of 22 natives. So they syndicated mm -hmm. themselves. They created this group. They each bought parcels. My great grandfather ended up with three parcels of land and other families in that group. So it was very strategic, I think, of the R.H. Kumalo, who is also one of my grandfathers, to have thought this through because he understood that being exempted and having this missionary sort of association gave him the access to the land and he recognized that others had to be pulled in. The 1913 Land Act had not yet been enacted. They signed in 1911. My great-grandfather being polygamous meant that it was a little bit illicit in terms of him even being part of it. So he was told to lie low. Don't need to, you know, we'll get your thumbprint because he didn't write. And we'll get all your information at the right time you can emerge. Land is such an issue uh, in our country. I was just listening to a whole interview on land claims and how... Um, you know, the Department of Land Reform is actually engaging with families that have put claims on their land. So for us to have this in our family, I think, was a significant way to start the book. And can you tell us a bit about your father's parentage? Because he took the name of his stepfather, who he considered as his true father. Can you tell us how did Stephen Sanguini's heritage give him and his children the right to be exempt from native law? Yes, that's very interesting. So my father, his full names, when you read them, are Stanislas Kumbuzo Mzilankata Sangweni. Mzilankata is actually his clan name. He was born out of wedlock, and his biological father was Mac Kambule. The Kambule's clan names are Amazilankata, the Zilankata. So that when he was born, his grandfather said, 
in spite of denied paternity of your birth, because Kambule denied, I am going to call you Mzilangata. So there was that. But um, along came Stephen Sangweni, whom he adored. He was a, a father that I think, a dream father, you know, in how my father would describe him. And he also came from a family of great interest. He was colored, um, a very dark-skinned colored man. His father was Zulu and his mother was Scottish, Annie Lawrence and Ernest Sangweni. And so they had, you know, children and they also were exempted because of their, you know, colored status, exempted from native law. This meant he could access the police and become a sergeant. It meant that um, in his status as a sergeant, he was able to secure good jobs. They lived in Fryhead. They lived in a, a nice neighborhood, you know, the police neighborhood. They had structures or houses that would have been for people of an elite sort of exempted class. And so all those benefits, I think, in the early ages of my father's growing up were passed on to him. He had access to that, good schooling, comfortable home, living with his mom and dad, until sadly um, they also passed on. And your father was also an anti-apartheid activist. Yes. Um, and in the book, you describe having visits from Uncle O.R. Yes. Uh, can you just tell us a bit about what you remember about this time when you had visits from anti-apartheid activists like O.R. Tambo visiting your family? Yes. I think you touch on one of my favorite chapters in the book. It's chapter nine, and it's called Number 10, Kalungu Road. And um, a, a significant part of my formative years as a child took place in Lusaka, Zambia. So we were living there. My parents had relocated there. Initially, my father was really um, there because he had a United Nations job as a rural sociologist. But his engagement with the African National Congress, who were headquartered in Lusaka, Zambia, from 1974 where we are, when we arrived, he really became very politicized, as uh, both him and my mother. They met many ANC cadres, Thabo Mbeki, Ruth Mompati, Sanel Mbeki, Gertrude Shop, and the names go on. Mavusom Simang, who actually is my father's nephew. And so President Oliver Tambo was known to everyone as uh, either chief or OR. That's how he was referred to, and that was a form of respect. And um, he was a wanted man by the apartheid regime successfully um, being able to mobilize the world into sanctions and, you know, the anti-apartheid movement. So he was really a wanted man. So he often had to be taken to safe houses. And our house was identified as one of those safe houses in Lusaka. And so as a child, it wasn't uncommon to be woken up late at night because um, these visits were never really spoken about. They were secret. And we'd be woken up, my brother and I, and we'd have to move into our parents' room and our bedrooms would be given up for President Oa Tambo and his security detail. And I just remember in the mornings waking up and I've written about it, you know, that aroma of bacon and eggs. And my mom is now entertaining the president of the ANC and her big brother, you know. So it was very warm. He was, he was such an accessible human being. And not just in Lusaka, many years later when we would meet him in Kenya, when we were now living in Kenya, Oa Tambo just had a way of making everyone feel present. If he was engaging with a little child, which I was at the time, I, I was barely 10, you know, he would ask you, what are you studying at school? What are you going to be when you grow up? Looking at you, engaging with you, making you feel important. And that was what he was really known for, even in political circles, you know, how he engaged and how he was sincere and intentional about everything he did. Mm -hmm. And tell us a bit about the research process for this book. Was a lot of your family's history documented? So informally, yes. My, my, my father was a great storyteller. And, and I hope that's what I've uh, inherited in terms of his love for history. Um, but really, I, I mean like professorial stuff. He would tell us about his Sandwana and the strategies of Shaga Zulu and... Uh, you know, the great wars of all the, the different um, African nations and so on. So he was, he was very good at that. But he also was very good at interweaving family history into it. So, you know, we would sit at family lunches and just as we think we're about to eat, he'd say, let me tell you a story, 1817. And then we'd be like, oh, it's going to be a long one. But he would get into all of that. And I think that's why I wanted to 
embellish that even in the beginning of the of the yeah. book. So the research started really when he was still alive uh, during COVID, and he said, "We've got to write my book." So we started collecting. So I would say, you know, if I was in the library with him or in his study, he would say, "Okay, this is for the book," and it would be maybe an era in Lusaka or these speeches. And I think he was thinking of a really different type of book. It was going to have his speeches and his work as a ANC cadre and his work in the United Nations. So I used a lot of that. My mother is a great collector of photography. You know, she has all the family albums beautifully laid out. So I used photographs. I interviewed people. We had a nephew of ours who also interviewed my dad during COVID. So it was all of that interviews, documents that he had kept, books that he would refer to that became my source, the internet, uh, and all of that really assisted me in bringing the book together. And in all of your research, was there anything about your father that was profound for you? Um, that's an interesting question. I think for me, the meeting with Dr. Swu Vil Ngomo one of his fellow commissioners when he joined the Public Service Commission was quite an eye-opener. In fact, you know, people ask how much was in the book and how much was left out. You know, this interview was amazing. I went to his home and we sat for two hours and I recorded it and then I transcribed it. But basically he was giving me the history of the Public Service Commission and I had heard it through my dad's, you know, my dad had given me his perspective. But just listening to someone who worked alongside my dad, with my dad, who knew him intimately, they knew each other from the Codessa days, a great amount of mutual respect for each other. You know, he could tell anecdotes about my dad. But I think just also emphasizing the, the strain that it was to transform the Public Service Commission, the pushback that a lot of comrades in the ANC were giving my father and his fellow commissioners. You know, they all thought they were aligned and moving in one direction. And often there was pushback um, because, you know, now different people had different objectives. So I'll give an example, uh, the tenure of director generals. So director generals in many other countries, when they did their research, are uh, like permanent secretaries in some, in, that's the name they would be called, but they have a tenure. They will be there in their position for 25 years because those countries have learned, Malaysia, for example, Canada, the UK, they've learned that by having a permanent public servant in a senior position means that the implementation of policy is consistent and it's vested. Uh, whereas the changing that was taking place based on ministers coming in and out was very disruptive. And this is what my father and his colleagues were trying to Put a stop to. So that's an example of the sort of pushback that he would be getting from colleagues in his beloved ANC that he really worked for for many years. Yeah. yeah. And in what ways do you believe that your father's story resonates with the current struggles experienced by marginalized communities today? So, you know, when my father did his work, it came from a very deep place. He was a rural sociologist. And he used his training that he got in Roma University in Canada, in Nova Scotia, and as well as Cornell University. And his objective was always to work with the people, especially rural people. He had a great empathy and a great understanding because he grew up a rural boy, you know, even though later on he went to live with his father, Stephen Sangweni, and his mom. Um, growing up on his grandfather's farm, herding cows and cattle, uh, his parents passed away, living in this huge communal village where life was not easy. You know, things didn't come easy. It wasn't easy to educate a child and take them through, you know, till university. So he had that appreciation. And coming back into South Africa, for example, and starting the School of Rural Development was a big thing for him because it meant he could now be a part of empowering farmers teaching people what land ownership meant and how you farm your land, how you feed your family, but how you also work in cooperatives, how you work as a community, how you then have a surplus of whatever it is you're farming, how you also diversify your farming, that you know you, you don't only rely on livestock, you also rely on other forms of grain, 
and surplus means that you are successful and you have money and circulating that money into the economy meant that farmers were contributing so for him this book resonates i think in a, in the sense that if you're reading it and you are a young person who's lost hope for example you see that it was possible for this young rural boy to become a great man great in the sense of education and access to opportunities and i think um he would have loved that to know that uh if there's one person who can be changed just because the story resonates and they can see themselves in him, um, then it, I've achieved what I was trying to do. And lastly, how does your father's experiences shape your views on activism and sacrifice? And what lessons do you think are most important for future generations? So it's, it's so interesting because I think my parents' activism was very quiet. So they were underground. And it was useful for them to be underground because not everyone needed to be an overt activist so that if the ANC had to do its work and, as I say, find safe houses, that would be uh, important. But his activism was also utilizing his education. So, for example, when President O. R. Tambo turned to one of the a senior ANC leaders named Cindy Somfenyana and said, I need you to start an education committee. They were doing that because there was an influx of young people from the 1976 uprisings coming into all the frontline countries. And these young people could not access further education because of the limitations of what Bantu education had done. And it was in the masterminding of working out what a national education committee should look like that they were able to come up with a school called Somafko the Solomon Mahlangu Freedom College, so that these young people could be put into this school. Um, the gaps that they had from their limited Bantu education could be addressed. And then they could also now start accessing good education from the different opportunities that were available to them. So I use that example in terms of that was the type of activism that my mother and father really practiced. It was practical. And later on, when we came back to South Africa, those experiences were carried on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the School of Rural Development and Farming that he started in, in KZN, these became real examples of how he was able to deliver it. I mean, working in the United Nations, his work with the United Nations was really in the SADC countries, uh, the East African countries, also developing solutions for poor, impoverished rural communities using his skills and what he had learned. That's a form of activism. Um, it's, it's not overt. There were other activists who were out there negotiating sanctions with political leaders. Um, that was not what he was doing. But when he came back now, even as a public servant in the Public Service Commission, his vision was always about public servants delivering and giving service to the people, be it from a point of education or hospitals and, and, and you know, medical care and health um, or safety and security. All the elements and all the different departments of the government working for the people. And for him, that was always a, a very big focus. The campaign was called Batu Pili, the people first. Mm -hmm. And I think that was my father's life, working for the people and putting the people first and ahead of himself. That was Lindiwe Sangweni Sido, here to unpack her book, The Syndicate of 22 Natives, The Stan Sangweni Story.